thanks to all the speakers for enlightening us with different topics. And here is our first question, which is open to all, I mean, all three speakers. This is to all three speakers. Now, how can we leverage cross-sector collaboration between governments, business, and non-profit to address the systemic issues of sustainability, poverty, and housing affordability, ensuring that economic growth and social well-being mutually reinforce our pursuit of a more inclusive society. So this is to all three speakers. Yeah, anyone can start. Yeah, yes, Rob, please. I'm happy to have a lash at that, but uh, I understand that I'm one human's opinion. Um, about uh, quite a while ago, we did some training in the topic of the collaborative operating system. And so there is education and training and a process available for better uh, collaborative discussion to be had. Typically, systems and governments and churches and organ institutions around the world default to a hierarchy. And hierarchies are wonderful in some circumstances. If your building's on fire and a bloke runs in with a red hat and says, that's the exit, a hierarchy works really well. We don't need a vote. We just need clear direction. However, certainly facing the wicked problems of our time, we need a far more nuanced and a far better process of discussion, conciliation, collaboration to uh, decide on actions. And uh, we see an orange smurf being a dictator in some parts of the world, and we see really poor outcomes in other parts of the world where the hierarchy is no longer fit for purpose. And I would suggest that in lots of our systems, governance, institutions, that there are other models that would serve us well to try. Uh, Kinish, in terms of poverty, I think the first is to, for all parties you mentioned, uh, I think should we should all understand that we are in this together. So if, if, say, poverty is not like a poor man's problem or, or a government's problem or an NGO's problem, it's everyone's problem and it threatens everyone's uh, survival. So uh, which is what we somewhat experience in Sri Lanka also. And, and this we see globally. Uh, globally now there is a trend uh, that is going, that is, uh, I think, Rowan talked about the housing uh, crisis, the affordability. So there's a huge, the social fabric, the, the social order, the economic order, the political order is being stretched. Uh, and we see this uh, everywhere. So firstly, I think it's the understanding that we are all in it together and we all have to pay. It's not the government's job to pay. It's not the, the NGO's job to pay. We all have to contribute to make this situation better. Uh, so that understanding has to come in and even businesses has to pay. So the example that I gave, it's a local businessman who started to, um, with that education platform. So, you know, things like that. Uh, everyone has a role to play. Right now, Sri Lanka has very high taxes and people are not liking it. And actually majority of the people who should, who ought to be paying taxes are not paying taxes. They're avoiding taxes. So those things should be combated by educating. Uh, otherwise, everyone would like to enjoy a free ride. Here, no one can or will be able to enjoy a free ride. So I think education is very critical. And discussing these things very openly is very critical. Okay. Uh, I'll take the next question. Yeah, the question is to Richard. So considering rapidly evolving global and uh, technological landscape, how can businesses like the one you presented 
adapt to their strategic decision-making process to remain competitive and innovative in the market? <laughs> um, I mean, the, 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 the interesting thing about, I, I've been a computer, you know, involved in computers all my working life. Um, and when I started, the idea was that computers would, uh, would give would would take away the drudgery of work and would give people more leisure time and we'd all be working less and uh, i think we we know that that hasn't panned out uh, what's happened is some people have come phenom- become phenomenally rich and have plenty of leisure time and other people are working harder than ever um so you know we we do i mean the 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 other the other speakers are probably far more qualified to talk about this than I am, in fact. But I mean, we talk about, you know, we're all we're all in this together that we're OK. We all live on the same planet. That's true. Um, certainly at times like when we're talking about crisis, climate crisis, when we talked about covid before and that we say, oh, we're all in the same boat. No, we're not all in the same boat. We're all in the same storm. But some people are on ocean liners and some people are in flimsy dinghies. That's where we are. We're not all in the same boat at all. We're just all in the same storm. And some people are better equipped to cope with it than others. Um, when I look at government policy, I, I I despair sometimes because I look at what the governments are doing. But I say, how can we get them to focus on things like poverty and inequality and climate change and poverty are so closely linked you can't and so and climate justice are so lo- cl- closely linked you can't solve one without solving the other and racism comes into this as well we all know the global south suffers because of what the global north has done um but when when we see that there's wars in ukraine and in palestine and in sudan i don't know how we're going to get governments to focus on you know longer term goals when there's so much You know, when we're trying to blast each other off the face of the earth, I don't know how we get them to concentrate on policies that make it a fairer world. I wish I I knew. And uh, artificial intelligence does have something, you know, it has parts to play. I mean, it has parts to play in uh, improving production techniques. It has parts to play in improving medical diagnosis and all of these things. But the downside is it also has a part to play and it's already playing that part in huge amounts of misinformation. And, you know, our own government, our own prime minister has been trying to get governments together to talk about the opportunities and the threats of AI. Um, But uh, he had a conference. I don't know how good it was. We saw him, um, you know, sidling up to Elon Musk. But, you know, I'm not sure how far that went and how much good that did. Um, Sorry, I didn't really answer the question. I just gave some despair there. (laughs) Thanks, Richard. Thank you, Richard. So the next question is to Rowan. Uh, As you mentioned during the presentation, it's about the affordability versus the investment. Considering that houses have become more of an investment than a home for people, how can policymakers balance housing affordability with the interest of real estate investors? Uh, in Australia's marketplace, just be very, very clear that the government, the industry, and the people who've established the system don't want it to change. So asking them to be enlightened and have better behaviour is highly unlikely to go anywhere. Um Governments in Australia, just for an uh, for instance, hoover up forty percent. That's not fourteen. That's four zero percent of a house and land package in fees, taxes, and charges in every single one. So there is no incentive for systemic change from the architecture of the system. However. Humans can absolutely say this malarkey has got to stop and take, as Richard would advocate, direct action. Um, So 
you know, collating voices together to demonstrate a better way. And with People Purpose Place platform, we're not looking for the architecture and the system to change. That's a forlorn, you know, I don't have the patience for that. Um, better people than I can go and attempt that. But if you do it household at a time, within the architecture and the system that exists, you can absolutely have a great one. So don't wait for the system to change. It's got no incentive to change. Go out and do it on your own with coaching and support and we can help you with the architecture. Thanks, Robin. Actually, we are running short of time. So last question to Perintu. You spoke about the interconnectedness of poverty and the global trends. So how do the recent geopolitical changes and the global crisis, such as the pandemic which we faced and the climate change, impact the traditional economic models aimed at poverty reduction? So I think this is common to the whole world, but I'll take uh, Sri Lanka as an example. So globally, we've seen increase in commodity prices, fuel prices are increasing. Uh, that's putting pressure on uh, everyone uh, globally. Interest rates have increased. Uh, that is putting pressure on everyone. Uh, and as a result, uh, so because of the very cheap period of very cheap money that we had for more than a decade, um, all governments globally piled up a huge amount of debt. And uh, now almost all of them are finding it very difficult to pay it back because the interest rates have increased and, and refinancing it is, is difficult. So, uh, and most of the, in most places, the governments are the ones who have been supporting the poor. Uh, now government finances are stressed. Uh, it's very difficult for them to raise finances. They raise taxes. Again, a disproportionate burden falls on the poor uh, because it's uh, mostly done through consumption taxes. Uh, so, so it's a vicious cycle. Uh, it, it probably has reversed all the achievements, at least in the case of Sri Lanka, uh, what we've achieved over the maybe the past several decades uh, have been reversed in the, in the space of last maybe two, three years. Um, and, and global trends have contributed. The pandemic immediately, uh, Sri Lanka had a huge tourism income uh, that virtually screeched to a halt and it was almost zero. Uh, then during the period, there was huge amount of expenditure the government had to incur in terms of providing welfare, vaccines, uh, and later, uh, because of information that the vaccines weren't ineffective or were not effective, uh, there was a reluctance from the population to take the vaccine. So some of it was discarded. So all that money flew back to the uh, wealthier nations. Uh, so all of the events that has happened probably, and, and we had a terrorist attack in 2019, again, that had a negative impact on the on the tourism. And the reasons cited were that uh, it's because it was a retaliatory attack to the New Zealand attack. So, so this, everything is interconnected. Now there's a uh, war happening in, in, in Gaza and that's going to have an impact on oil prices and it's hurting sentiments across communities globally uh, and, and questioning the, the uh, ability of countries to protect human rights. So all of this is having an impact on, on how governments or the ability of the governments or uh, the authorities to uh, support the poor. When the taxes are higher, rich or even people who are paying taxes are less willing to pay more taxes. So then how do you fund uh, those programs? How do you fund essential uh, expenditure that are needed to fund your education, uh, health system, supporting the poor. So that, in a in a nutshell, is how it has happened over the past few years. And this crisis, the climate change, obviously will have an impact uh, on on food. Uh, the wars have had impact on food availability and food prices. So, uh, so everything has a link and and is linked. Uh, I hope I answer the question. It's way too complex to uh, give give a, a few minutes uh, of uh, answering. So, yeah. Thank you, all the speakers, for responding to the questions. Now, 
because of lack of time Thank we you. can't take more questions so all the questions will be sent to you through from us so over to you Morris. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.